Welcome to Stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw, and that would be Mr. Briscoe, WWE Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son. And I've been so excited about this next guest because he has done it all. He has seen it all. He's the father of a Hall of Famer. He's the Memphis Hall of Famer. He is Mr. Jerry Jarrett. Mr. Jarrett, thanks for joining the show. Thank you for having me. I, I've been looking forward to joining you guys. Well, Jerry, Jerry, when I saw you in, in Tampa here at, at one of those autograph things we were doing, you know, you, uh, we, we, we kind of uh, wandered towards each other. You and I's uh, background in history, uh, I, I kind of kidded you earlier, and John, uh, uh, John kids me all the time. There isn't many people that's had more experience in this business than me. But we're speaking to one that that's has me by, by a few years, and not, not many, but... Uh, by by a couple of years, but the history of Southern wrestling always went through Memphis, Tennessee, and the Jarrett's and, and uh, the Welches, the Fullers, the Greens, the Fargo, the Togo, the Lawlers. I mean, but the Jarrett's were right there with all those historic characters. And so that, that's what our show is about. So we really look forward to getting into some, some great historical stories from you about some of those true Memphis legends. And, and you don't, you, I think you brought it up when we, we kind of hit each other. Back in the days, you know, uh, Nick Goulas was the promoter. And uh, I think that's how your mother, Christine, got started with selling tickets uh, uh, for Nick Goulas at the local wrestling matches there. And, uh, and then, of course, as you became older, you, 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 you were able to, Nick was looking for cheap child labor, so he was able to throw you in, take a ticket to sell a program. So your, your start and your history is so, so fascinating and everything. Can you take us through some of those early days that, that you can remember? I know you can't go all the way back and sitting at your mom's feet while she's selling tickets, or maybe you can. So kind of take us through that historical deal and all the way through to when you, you and King and what, what precipitated that of you and King finally buying good us out. But as I was going, you know, the, the rumors among the boys don't go to Tennessee unless you want to starve with this. And then, and then, then there's that historic story about my brother who was there right out of college and a damn boulder fell on his car and it's told that uh, old Pontiac out and he had no money or no car. And Nick wouldn't give him any money because he knew he would leave. And so <laughs> Spike, Spike Monroe gave him $25. Jack went down the bus station, bought a call, bought a, got a bus ticket and went back to Oklahoma and quit the business for a while. So, uh, so I don't. I don't even know if you were aware of that. That was probably before your partnership time went. So yeah. take us, take us, try to take us through that that you know, that timeline back those days. Well, to make it real simple, my mother was a single parent, uh, raising two children on her own. So she got a part-time job selling tickets at the old Hippodrome. Uh, me and my sister would go because now this, this is the Nashville, right? The Hippodrome. Yeah, the the Hippodrome was a historic place, right. and um, we'd sit on little coke. Back then, cokes came in a wooden case, and we'd sit on the box <laughs> office. And as time went on, Nick Goulas let me sell programs. Uh, they sold for a nickel a piece and I got to keep a penny. Uh, then I, as I got older, I got to uh, take tickets up at the door and that's the first time I met Lou Thales. Uh, and, and I was just in awe of him. And years later, I got to work with him and, and book him. Uh, we talked Jerry, about- Jerry, Jerry, what- when you met Lou Thad, I mean, this was a man who carried himself like a champion. Did, 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 you were a small kid, of course, at that time. When Lou walked through that door, you knew you were meeting a champion. You knew you were meeting a real professional. He carried himself and handled himself, even at that time, right, like, like a world champion. So that, that, that had to be an inspiration to you. Yes. He, he, most of the wrestlers would go through the back door of the hip drone which led right to the dressing room. Lou drove up in a 
taxi cab right in the front of the building. And he, you know, he walked very erect, like almost a military bearing. And he walked up and I said, uh, Mr. Thez, I would, I'd appreciate it if you'd shake my hand. And he, he looked down at me and he said, uh, son, you'll go places in this business. Uh, stay humble like you are. Where is the dressing room? And I pointed out to him. Uh, never forgot that moment. It, uh, you know, it was very special to me. It is to this day. And uh, I was, you know, I, I loved your brother and I loved Dory Funk because they, to me, were in the mold of Luthes. Uh, when they got in the ring, they wrestled and they were serious. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm blessed that I got to, uh, I got to actually wrestle Luthes. Wow. Uh, I wrestled Dory. I didn't get to wrestle your brother, Jack Briscoe, but, uh, I loved him. Great champion. So Tojo Yamamoto was the one that ended up breaking you into the business, right? When, when did you go from taking the tickets to deciding that you wanted to get in the business as far as the performing side? Well, I was, uh, because of our situation back in those days, you got a, uh, what's called a hardship license. So I was able to get a license to drive a car at 14. And as soon as I got that license, uh, uh, Nick let me start voting the, what we call the spot shows, the little country towns around the towns that ran weekly. And uh, I did that until I went to college and um, finished college and, and got a job at a bicycle company. And, and an event happened in which the owner's son took over the company and we've seen that uh, happen uh, we've seen that happen in several businesses <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh bill hannon took over from his father cw hannon and and put all of the older executives uh demoted and he made me a vice president. And uh, instead of thinking that was great, I thought it was terrible. And I, about a week later, I went in and I said, Mr. Hannon, when I'm Walter Bannis's age, your son will take over and he'll sit, sit me out in the secretary pool like you did Walter Bannis. That's not for me find my replacement I'm gone I didn't have a job so I went to the uh, wrestling office and asked if I could promote spot shows like I used to Nick said yes one thing led to another a referee had a wreck and got hurt so they had me run out and buy a referee shirt and said you're the referee tonight hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, then they gave, they called Tojo and said, will you drive Jerry? I think it was, uh, oh, maybe Helena, Arkansas, some little town. And uh, we struck up a friendship and he, Tojo said, why don't you uh, wrestle? You only make $15 to referee and you can make. 50 or 100 for, to wrestle. I said, I'm too low. I'm too little. Well, Tojo was about 5'7, mm -hmm. and I was about 5'9 and 5'10. So he whipped the car over and he said, I'll show you too little. I'll kick your butt. <laughs> and what do you think? Edget? Oh, no, sir. I'm, I'm sorry. I meant muscular. I'm too little. And, uh, Anyway, we got through that, and uh, he started training me in his apartment 
to uh, to work, and he went up to the, with me to Nick and Roy Welch, and said, uh, uh, "Jerry's pretty good hand. I need to book him." My mother was the bookkeeper in the office next to it. Or she came through that door and she said, <laughs> "If you put him, the first time you put him in the ring to wrestle, is my life. I'll quit." So of course that led my mother and I to two or three weeks being crossed with each other. And she said, uh, "You don't understand this, but because I'm in the office, even though I have no power and no authority." If the wrestlers will hurt and you don't know how to defend yourself. I said, uh, Taney, I was raised on 22nd Avenue, and whether you know it or not, I can handle myself. He said, You can't business. And uh, I said, Well, how do I prove it? She said, uh, I've already talked to Sailor Moran. I don't know if you remember him, but he was an old school and he was retired at a market. So I said, give me his number. So I called him and I said, Mr. Moran, will you trust me to defend me? He said, yeah, you already called me. Come to my market. Well, his market was out on Lebanon Road and it had a cinder parking lot. And so from the first day I got there, I left with bloody cheeks, bloody arms. <laughs> and you can imagine, y'all went through some of it down in the, your pit in Tampa. Right. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, I mean, I just, you know, I, I was stubborn and I kept going back after about six months of that uh well no maybe two months the next four months he proceeded to try to teach me to de defend myself and then he went off and he said gary won't ever win a gold medal in the olympic <laughs> but none of these jabronis here hurt him and uh so they started booking me. That's they, they, they being uh, Nick Gulas and uh, or, or Fuller, or who, 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 who booked you first? Roy Welch. That's Buddy. Roy Welch. Okay. And Robert and Ron's granddaddy. Right. Nick Gulas. Roy was the real owner and the senior partner, and Nick was the front man even though he was a full 50% partner. But Roy was the boss. Always wondered about the politics of that territory because it was never really clear. And Nick did such a good job of disguising himself at the, as a boss. But, you know, as been in the business and later as partners with Eddie, you know, I found out that uh, that uh, Roy was uh, the, the, the boss of, of the organization. Oh, right. <laughs> Roy was a clever guy he was uh, Indian descent and was tough and really really tough. so Nick wanted to be the big guy so Roy would tell him what to do and Nick would <laughs> pull Roy's dirty deeds <laughs> so word got out across the world that Roy was the good guy and Nick was the villain Right. So, who made the payoffs? <laughs> uh, well, the bad ones. <laughs> the bad ones. <laughs> Troy would make them. And then he would pass the sheet over. Their desks were side by side. And then he'd pass the sheet over and tell Nick, uh, cut $400 out of that payroll so nick would go to slashing it and so all the boys thought nick was the bad pay 
it was crawling. Well, I saw an interview you did either with Conrad or with Hannibal TV where you're talking about Roy Welch after he got a little bit of Alzheimer as he got older. And you thought that Mario Galento was actually sent after you. He obviously came after you by Roy Welch uh, at yeah. one point. Yeah, Roy got dementia or Alzheimer's or whatever. And some, some people... You know how it is in wrestling politics. They got in his ear and said, Jerry's going to steal your business. So Galento had a reputation, supposed to be a tough guy. So Jerry Lawler and I had a 30-minute Broadway on Memphis TV. And we went at it pretty good. You would know if you're on TV and really get after it the end of 30 minutes you're pretty much spent and at least i was and uh, right. he jumped the ring i was on one knee trying to catch my breath after the bell rang, and he hit me right behind the ear and i thought it was sam bass had potatoed me until i <laughs> reached up and uh there was a goose egg behind my ear and uh my instincts from Sailor Moran kicked in and I lunged up off of it and he lost his eye. Wow. Yeah. And I I tried to go ahead and pull it all out. But I, <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> I you know, I was fighting for my life. I, yeah. I understand. I understand. You have that lump behind your ear, and that instincts just can't uh, kick in, and you, you 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 just go. Yeah, he was either crazy or a tough old coot because he rolled out of the ring and ran door, pushed his eye back in, came back with the tire tube. You know, truckers used to check them, but then his stupidity kicked in because when you get in the you have to either come over the top rope or bend down sure. and step through him. And he bent up through him, and I copped him, got the stick, and tried to kill him. He had two or three hundred stitches to sew him up. And then the last we heard of him, he came to the Mid South Coliseum, and one of the fans came and said, Galento and his wife are sitting in the second row, and his wife's got 38 in her pocketbook and you need to be may have come back for revenge because that was on TV and everybody saw it and so Pat Malone I don't know if you remember that I remember that name Pat Malone yes. Pat was another tough old guy right he uh, went in behind Pat carried a Barlow uh, hook bill knife and he pulled it out he said, Mario, better make it a good shot because I'm going to throat as soon as you. And Mario and his wife got up and left, and I never heard anymore. Well, and he, Mario, he, Mar Mario did have that reputation. I guess uh, uh, was that that was uh, obviously after he had gotten that brutal fight and that and with with Buddy Fuller and Buddy Buddy had helped. Just yeah. beat the holy tar out of each other. Yeah, they, uh, but you know, that was just their way of working hard. Right. So it wasn't a real shoot. That and, wasn't a shoot with uh, Fuller and Mario. I, I, I'd always heard that was, but it's good to hear that it wasn't. They just worked that stiff. Because I know with Mario, I, I was lucky because I got Mario in his later days when he came up in Oklahoma, but he was. He was so old then he couldn't. He if he tried to shoot, he wouldn't shoot very far. <laughs> yeah, but he, you know, he had no business jumping in. But you know, he thought, well, here's this little punk. I'll jump in, and nail one punch. Huh. And so, what was the reaction after that fight and in the back there? I guess the boys had a completely different different look at you at that time. Well. Yeah, I mean, you know, they kind of thought I was crazy. 
Uh, yeah, we've been trying to kill the guy. Yeah, we would. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, they, uh, and then, you know, you and your brother are tough guys. You don't have to go around and tell anybody. I, I never told anybody about Salem Moran until I was way out of the business because Sailor drilled that into me. He said, you can defend yourself, but it won't be with a double leg dive. And, and you know, the, your, your, the bones in your hand are the weakest in your whole body and the bones in your opponent's head are the toughest in the whole body. Well, how many stupid people have you seen punch each other in the head. And and Taylor and Pat Malone, those guys, you, if you hit somebody, you hit them in the throat and collapse their larynx and then the over. One finger in the eye. Eddie Graham and I were really close. He was like my dad. And we went for two years over this very argument we're on the we're on a plane and he comes back and sits down by side of me he said i won't tell you jerry about the toughest man i've ever known really he said yeah he jack nobody and i mean nobody i've had him and bob and he can beat Bob. He is the toughest son of a gun ever known. And I'd like you to get to know him. And I said, Eddie, there ain't no horse that can't be rode. And there ain't no cowboy that can't be rode. I said, Tim Wood was the toughest son of a gun and a big shoot. A guy got the ring and unmask him because he bit his somebody out there maybe not a wrestler but somebody at the bar can beat Jack Briscoe well Eddie got up and went back to his other seat and didn't talk to me for two years wouldn't take the phone <laughs> got so mad at me and finally Jack called me and said why aren't you booking me up in Memphis I said, I tried, but Eddie won't even take my calls. He said, yeah, he told me about that. And he, I know you're right. And I think deep down, he knows you're right. And you, you know it. I mean, there's. Well, the thing about it is, Jerry, nobody ever tried him. So <laughs> they will no. never know. <laughs> what I'm saying is, you know. It. Yeah, I know. I know that everybody can be bit at some sometimes. Yeah, all you got to do is watch that US UFC <coughs> and they don't last long on top. Yeah, yeah. So what brought you and Eddie back together? Was Jack uh, making that uh, when making that call and then you got you got finally got opportunity to book him? I said, would you talk to him? And and, and Jack went to talk to him and said, you know, Eddie, there ain't many people that love you, but Jerry Jarrett loves you like that and this is silly he didn't mean disrespect to me so eddie called me and when you when you don't see that. <laughs> i see that's a lesson to you mr briscoe all the times that you have stretched me after shows in bars one day i'm gonna get you <laughs> well, you did get me out one day, blindsided me. You know, you're right, uh, Jerry. People can get you. Uh, we, we were at a big pay per view and saw you, Brown. You know, the country and western band, they were rehearsing, they were our pre show. So, John was up, at the, of course, being a, a mark for Sawyer Brown, was up <laughs> being a little group, up being a little groupie for Sawyer Brown. So, I was walking out to Ring to do my job. Back then, WWF, they had these big bicycle barricades, you know, it'd take a 400-pound man to move the damn thing. And uh, so I'm walking out. 
all of a sudden saw your brown plant all of a sudden i feel this and my body just just crackles down it's just a 330 pound texan blindside me from behind taken my ass down so you're right you there is a time saw your brown quit playing and said well i guess there's something going on back there with bradshaw and briscoe and they quit playing you know to watch watch the tussle and he actually he, he had me cornered where i couldn't do anything so you're right there there is <laughs> I admit to it. Uh, and a horse that they can't be rodated, a cowboy it can't be uh, can't be uh, beat. So uh, I got beat by that by, by Mr. Bradshaw, and I give him that one victory. You know, I give it to him. <laughs> hey, and then Mr. Jared, I I hid from him for about a week. <laughs> <laughs> then I he got him. He was so back. mad. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sorry, Brown. What's that? So yeah, Sawyer Brown was playing the uh, like going through their set in the afternoon, and Jerry was sitting there listening, and I jumped Jerry from behind. <laughs> <laughs> I got him good. I, I saw your brain. Did either of you know him? No, no. Just, just from that, uh, just from that uh, that situation. John, is Jerry's uh, audio okay? Yeah, it's cutting out just a little bit, but I think it's okay. Okay. Mark Miller lives in Nashville and uh Ron and Don Harris and yeah all go out to his place. Ron Mark loved basketball, had a gym in his house. And uh he wrote all the music for Jeff and I for TNA. Wow. Yeah. Funny you always the Harris boys were great. I, I love those guys. They, they, had, they, had, they had a good run up in WWE, but it, what, what a couple of talented, great guys the Harris boys are. Yeah. Did you break those guys in, Jerry, the Harris boys? They already could wrestle. Oh, man, they were, they were, they were legitimately tough guys, too, right? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. We had an autograph session one time and uh, somebody had said something to uh, Sable and Vader said something back, but Vader had at that time a lawsuit or something on his, uh, some, some fan, he had an interaction that got a little violent and Vader didn't want to do anything. Well, the Harris boys didn't mind. <laughs> and they came by. Oh. It was a pretty good little bro there for a short time. And <laughs> they did very well. <laughs> Yeah, they're and they're both sweet guys. Great guys, great guys. So Jerry, take us take, take us back. Okay, you 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 you're there now. You're working for Nick Goulas, and uh, I hope you're not getting those lousy payoffs like we got. But uh, uh, I'm sure you wouldn't because your mom was the bookkeeper there. <laughs> so uh, so oh, I anyway. So anyway, how did how did the split come up? Where where if you finally had enough with Nick Goulas and the politics with Nick Goulas and and the unpopularity of of the territory that he created around around the Memphis territory, our Tennessee territory. Well, clear one thing up. No, because my mother was the bookkeeper, he could get by with sliding me, and the way I found out. We'd go to a town that had a in Louisville, I mean Memphis, wherever, Birmingham, Huntsville, and Tojo, and I never talked business, but I I I'm looking at my paycheck and I'm saying, Tojo, that's a pretty good house, Chattanooga. And and I got seventy dollars. He said I got 150. Oh man! And we did it all week, and and Tojo's check was a thousand dollars, and mine was like six fifty. So I had a little talk with him, and well, I really went to Roy, and Roy said it won't happen again. Um, what happened was I Jim Barnett bought. Uh, the Atlanta Territory, right? From um, um, Buddy Fuller, no, from Lester Welch. Lester and Buddy swapped Florida stock for Georgia stock, 
Lester was in Tampa with Eddie. So then that put Buddy Fuller, he couldn't get along with Ann Gunkel. And uh, so Lester is easygoing and quiet guy. And he said, I can handle her. Well, he couldn't, it got worse. Uh -huh. And uh, so Barnett wanted to come back to the United States from Australia. And uh, he, uh, he bought the territory and he flew to uh, Hendersonville and uh, offered me the job as a booker. And I said, uh, I'm doing real good here. Mr. Barnett, um, I don't believe I want to leave. And he said, I'll pay you $500 a day. If you're in Atlanta one day, 500. If you're there five days, 2,500. And back in, you have to go back into that time. I think about 72, 74. $500 a day was a big payoff. That was a big payday. So I took the job. We had some real good success. The Tennessee territory took a kind of a nosedive. And uh, Nick and Roy called me and said, if you'll come back and help book here and help put the territory back, we'll give you 10% of the territory. Well, Lord, that was music in my ears. Mm -hmm. I love Jim Barnett, really liked him, respected him, but I, you know, I was home and now had a chance to own part of the territory. So then that thing happened with Galento and Roy, we didn't see him anymore. He stayed on the farm. And so I bought 40%. Uh, they gave me the 10, five apiece. So I right. bought boys enough so that I'd have 50% for $50,000, which was a lot of money. A lot of money back then. Yeah. So time goes on and Nick is booking half the territory, Birmingham, Huntsville, Chattanooga, that end. I'm booking Memphis, Louisville, Evansville. So we're doing really good enough to carry the whole territory. We had profit, nice profit every month to cover up for Nick's losses. So I go into the office one day and Nick says, comes in my office and says, starting Monday, I'm going to move George to Memphis and take mm -hmm. care of him, put him on top. I said, no, sir, that ain't happening. He said, the hell it ain't. I said, no, I own as much of this business as you do. And I'm vetoing that move. He said, no, you don't. You need to call Cecil Bramstetter. That was his lawyer. And me being stupid, when I bought into the territory, I used Nick's lawyer. Huh. And, and Bramstetter said, you only bought an option, Jerry. And that option date has passed. You don't own nothing. I said, wow. so my thousand is gone? He said, yep. And you better Ooh. do whatever Nick wants you to do. So I told Nick, I said, you're making a terrible mistake. I don't know what I'm going to do, but you can't run this business. And so I went home to my house in Hendersonville, and sat down on my boat dock and cried real tears for three days. I was just devastated. And uh, finally, my wife one day walked down on the dock said, are you just going to sit here and rot? Um, you built that territory. Why don't you build it one yourself and you don't have to carry Nick? And it was like a light came on in my head. And so I went 
up to the house and I called Eddie Green. And I said, Eddie, Nick has screwed me and I don't know nothing up here. I'm going to open up myself. And he said, whatever I can do to help you, I will. And then I called uh, Vince Sr., not Jr., Vince McMahon Sr., told him the same thing. He said, however I can help you, I will. So I then started calling television stations that I dealt with, told them the situation. All the TVs said, we're going to go with you, Jim because we don't even know Nick Goods. And so I just, I had a little bit of money enough to get some newspaper ads and I started myself. So the blackest day of my life turned out to be a blessing. That's the reason I love that song. Uh, I thank God for unanswered prayers because it, it you know, it changed my life. <laughs> and, and Eddie uh, Eddie sent me everybody Jack, you <laughs> uh, and, Mike, uh, Mike, Steve, everybody I mean I, that was that, that was a co-op and, and, and it goes to that tie you know you had to made friends in that short amount of time with some very powerful people, you know, the Graham, the Barnett's, uh, Vince Senior, and uh, even Vern. I mean, <clears throat> that's what amazed me about your territory, Jerry, that you were able to, you were NWA, true and true, but you were able to work with all those other promoters and get their talent in and exchange talent. That oh. was remarkable. I mean, you had Bachwinkle in, you had a NWA champions in, I mean, you had you had them all in. You had probably superstar Billy Graham in through Eddie and uh, Vince Senior. <coughs> and uh, yeah. yeah, it was it was wonderful. Vince Senior sent me Andre the Giant, and you know he didn't go out much. And uh, so that talent really made the difference. And then when we had the National Alliance. Uh, Nick showed up with all of his lawyers and said, he's calling himself NWA and I'm the member. So anyway, Vince Sr. and Eddie Graham, and you know how powerful they were. Yeah, and, and worked together too. Yeah, and <coughs> both got up and spoke before the vote and said, Nick Goulas don't have a truth bone in his body and I'll risk my life that Jerry will tell the truth and do what's right. So they gave me the NWA membership. How important was it when he had that split uh, <coughs> with Nick and you were talking the talent that was there that was already on fire in, in Memphis? Uh, you know, he wanted to bring in his son, George Goulas, into Memphis, which was one of the big problems, which exposed the fact that you had been uh, a victim of fraud as far as. <coughs> How important was it for Lawler, Jerry Lawler, to switch and go with you? And was that a hard conversation to get Lawler to come and go with you? No, he 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 didn't like Nick way before this happened. And matter of fact, I would the booking before we split, uh, Nick would try to get Lawler, and I booked him a couple of times and. And Lola said, if you ever book me there again, I'll leave. <laughs> Not working for him. So, um, you know, after we got started, I gave Jerry 10% of the business because he was so valuable. You know, how many people can you book in Memphis 52 weeks a year on right. top? <laughs> Sell out most of the time. So, no, it wasn't hard. The... Uh, we had one little hiccup, the channel 13 in Memphis that was the TV and they were going with me except two weeks before I was supposed to start, uh, 
Lance Russell called me and said, my boss said we're dropping wrestling. If we go with you, we open ourselves up to a lawsuit. So that's when I ran over to Channel 5 and told them, you're number three in the market. Maury Grounder. I still love it, the memory of you. Uh, I said, I'll bring you the number one wrestling show in the country. I'll bring, I'll hire Channel 13, which was the number one station. I said, I'll bring their program director over here as my announcer and the top weatherman in the city, Dave Brown, I'll hire him. And he said, can we get him as a weatherman? I said, I don't know, that's up to you. So I, ran, I arranged for a meeting between them and he called me back and he said, I can't afford him. He, he said, how much are you all? He said, a thousand dollars. I said, I'll pay. It. So he said, you're on. And they paid me 1500 a week and all production cost. <laughs> We had Jerry Lawler on a couple weeks ago, and uh, Keith was telling a story about the one of the NWA meetings. You're talking about the NWA. When you show up and Vince McMahon Sr. starts bringing up the Bill After magazine about the midget that beat, <laughs> that beat Andre the Giant, how, how awkward was that to sit in that meeting knowing oh, that was coming up? If I <laughs> crawled under the chair, I would have. Was that your first meeting? Was that your first meeting that you attended? Oh, no, no. We'd been. And, okay. And Vince and his wife, we'd all always go out to eat. And, you know, by that time, we were really good friends. Okay. So he was protecting Andre, but he really didn't want to throw me under the bus. But as you know, Terry Funk. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Classic shit disturbing. <laughs> you think? <laughs> From the back of the room, Terry Funk puts his hands to his mouth and says, Come on, Vince, who was the little son of a bitch? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I got through it. How often did the NWA, like, I know you voted on the NWA champions. Title changes throughout the year. Did that, did that re require a consensus of the board or the NWA to do that? Yes. Very tightly held. Sam Munchnik was the czar. Right. And uh, he had a handful of people. Strangely, Vern Gagne, Vince Sr., Eddie Graham, and... Uh, Oklahoma. Leroy. 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 Yeah. Leroy McGurk. That was the power. And uh, the California and Shires, you know, they were well respected, but they wasn't the real power brokers. Eddie, Eddie was probably the next to Sam Munchnik, the most powerful man in the wrestling business. And so if you wanted the title change in St. Louis, Portland, L.A., Chicago, anywhere, you had to get it approved by the NWA and the NWA board, those power group, had to agree to. So the annual meeting wouldn't just go over. You wouldn't have a champion for the whole year. If you had a title change during the year, they had to meet somehow and agree to that, right? Right. They, they did. They had a championship committee, which was this power group. And, and they decided, that's why I pulled out. I, I never could get anybody's vote except Eddie's. And I'm not sure I got Eddie's because I didn't get, <laughs> uh, I wanted Lawler to have a, a title run. And uh, they kept telling me next year, next year, next year until I realized I wasn't ever going to get it. So. I called Vern one day and I said, uh, I want Lawler to be a world champion. Uh, if I drop the NWA and join the AWA, will you let him win the belt? I don't care if it's for three months. 
He said, sure. So that's why I went on the AWA band. I'm glad you brought that up, Jerry. I, I was, that was always a question in my mind, you know, because I, I eventually buy an ownership there. And John, even by an ownership in the NWA, if, as a minority partner, you had to be approved by their their executive board to to add a partner in there. So all, all of us had to get vetted through, right, uh, Jerry, through the NWA process, even to be a partner with one of these uh, promoters there. It was very strict. I mean, it was it was a territory and all the way through. I mean, if you and, and Jerry's right, Eddie Graham was the was the the the, the leader of the pack there, but it, it was strange. So yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I always wondered how you could, you know, NWA uh, uh, banner, but I I didn't know you weren't under the NWA banner at that at the time that you brought Vern in. You were AWA member that time when AWA membership was just you and Vern basically yeah well by the time I did that though the NWA was pretty much fragmented right and so you know I, Vern Vern really liked our territory because the, the boys the road warriors uh, everybody, you gave, you gave him an outlet. You took a lot of his guys that he originally trained, and you gave them their their original breaks down and out out of out of Minnesota, correct? Yes, yes. And uh, so anyway, he and I got it was it. It's real hard to call Vern your friend. Yeah, we were business associates. Uh that did a lot of business together, but, you know, Vern wasn't like Vince Sr. Vince Sr., I'd rather have his nod than a 30-page contract. He, he was... Vern, Vern had the ESPN, but also you had, uh, Joe Blanchard had USA Network, uh, who ended up losing it. Were you ever in the bidding for the USA Network during that time of cable television starting to become this national program uh, that ended up Vince McMahon Jr. ended up getting that uh, USA Network? Were you in the bidding for that, for the USA? Yes, and uh, um, my good friend Jim Barnett called me and said, uh, this cable TV will kill the wrestling business. Uh, you know, I, I hope you won't put Memphis TV on, on a cable network. And, you know, in, in retrospect, sometime I think, boy, I wish I'd have done that. But then when you, when you really weigh all the factors, I'm glad I didn't. Um, I mean, when I, you know, I, I went to uh, Minnesota with $3 million cashier's check in my coat pocket to buy a burn. And after we went to lawyers and everything got approved, he called me in and said, we forgot what we're going to do with Greg. And so I had a meeting with Greg and Greg wanted half the book and me to pay his country club membership a bunch of crap so that deal fell through but um see i would have had if that deal had gone through i'd have had espn usa i was already in dallas on channel 10 which had national exposure and my memphis territory i'd have I'd have had more market share than Vince Jr. But as it turned out, I think it's, I've got a philosophy that you're, we're all right where God wants us to be at every moment. Did, did you think that Super Clash, you know, Super Clash 3, 
was the one where everyone, all the promoters got together. Uh, I think Lawler worked with, uh, was it Kurt? And, or no, with, or with Kerry. And uh, that was the idea of making a unified front against uh, Vince McMahon that we know, Vince McMahon Jr. Did you think that that had su success potential when you first got into it? Now that was the Eddie Einhorn deal? Yes. Yes, it would have except for the greed of Bill Watts and Jim Crockett Jr. We, we had a meeting, Eddie, Eddie um, well, we had a meeting in Chicago and I don't know, I think 12 promoters were at the meeting and they voted for me to produce the TV in Memphis four weeks and in Louisville four weeks. And so I did, and they, you know, Eddie Einhorn had cleared a, a TV station in New York. So we ran those eight weeks of television and had the first match at the Meadowlands. And it was not a complete sellout, but it was real close. And Bill Watts and and Jim Crock Jr. said at that night, Jerry, we're out. This has proved we can be successful. We're going to work ourselves. And they did. I think both of them went bankrupt. <laughs> and but that that after that, did you realize that the, the territories was were were on the way out? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And you realize uh, the proliferation of cable television. You know, somebody was whether Vince did it or not, somebody was going to do it. But you realize at that point, it's probably going to be Vince McMahon. Yes. Yes. And uh, I knew it was over. And, um, you know, it's funny how things happen because right about that time, every time I would talk to Vince Sr., I would say, because here I'm this poor little country boy from Nashville. You know, he's running the biggest, strongest territory in the world, the Northeast. And every time he would help, with anything from sending me talent to offering to loan me money, whatever. I would say, if there's ever anything I can do to help, please let me So we lost. can you still? No, we, we lost, lost you for just, yes. Uh-oh. No, we lost him for good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, live TV. Live TV, the live like podcast, whatever. What do they call this, John? It's not TV. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Uh, we're, we're live, whatever it is. We <laughs> lost our paid guests there. Uh, one thing I want to ask you, though, um, Mr. Jarrett, was uh, did Vince really call Eddie Einhorn and tell him that this wasn't going to work? Eddie Einhorn, Eddie Einhorn, for those that don't know, was a, a uh, owner of the Chicago White Sox. Yeah, Eddie was there that night. And uh, what was ironic, during our meeting in Chicago Airport, Vince Jr. called Einhorn and said, Eddie, you're in the room with 12, 14 people that all think they're God. You, you couldn't get a sense of opinion to order pizza. And boy, how right on Vince was. Because there that night, I went to Ed, Eddie Anhorn and I said, Eddie, Bill Watts is out and Jim Crockett is out. So if, if you continue on, we're going to be three of us competing against Vince McMahon. I think this deal's over. And uh, so let me go talk to Vern. Well, I never heard back from any of them. Vern absconded with the gate. 
<laughs> the whole gate? The whole gate. None of us ever finished. I ended up having to pay my talent. So Vern took all the money. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't pay the talent or anything. He just oh, took the yeah. box office and gone. I'm guessing he paid the talent that was in For his. Him. But anyway, that was over. And, you know, Jim Crow did the WCW deal with Turner and. and uh, Jerry, Jerry, go ahead, John. Go ahead, Jerry. I, I was going to ask him about, you know, when, when you finally got the opportunity to team up with world class down in Dallas and walk us through, you know, who you negotiated with, because there's, there's several different stories out there that, 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 uh, that Fritz was all the way out of it. And that he had nothing to do with it. And there's stories that he, Fritz and, and you are the ones that negotiated. Would you clear up the air on that for, for uh, us? And I really liked Kerry. Uh, I used him as a talent. I thought he was, would have been a great, world champion um so he calls me one day and he says jerry kevin and i are going to close the doors no, we already closed the doors uh, we can't make it. if you want to come out here and see if you can pick up pieces you can and uh i said i'll fly out and look at it because the sportatorium had such history. Right. Uh, so anyway, what I found out is they, uh, they were in debt to the sportatorium about $12,000. They owed channel 10, 25,000 and, uh, miscellaneous bills. So I saw an opportunity for about 40,000. I could have a chance to make money. And so I called my friend at Red Man Chewing Tobacco, Pinkerton Tobacco Company. And I said, you want to sponsor my wrestling? It's $50,000. So, <laughs> so I got lucky and made 10,000 before <laughs> I invested. And uh, it was just miraculous. The people in Dallas were so starved for wrestling that uh, about our fifth show, we sold out for the tournament. And uh, then I was, I had 50% uh, and I gave Kevin 25% each. So they went from being bankrupt, getting checks for eight and $10,000 a month. And uh, so one day they showed up with a lawyer and said, uh, you took advantage of our, the lawyer told me that. And uh, so the next day I went to a lawyer and he said, we'll win the lawsuit, but they'll still be your partner. I said, you don't need that. I'll just watch them go back and sure enough, it did. Because neither one of them had any business. When we now, started, Fred, Fred, Fred was out of the loop on that at this time? When we started the deal, after I looked at it and paid off the Channel 10 and the auditorium and had everything running or ready to run, uh, Car Kevin, no, Carrie came to me and said, Dad, I'll talk to you. So I went out to the farm and uh, Fritz said, that we sat it down at the kitchen table and he said, Jerry, I just want to tell you this. I'm out of the wrestling business. Don't expect any help from me. Don't expect any input from me. And I feel like I should do this because we were fellow promoters in the NWA. These boys screw you they're both on drugs there ain't a 
honest bone in their body. That's their dad telling you this. At the table. With at mama, the, mama over filling chip, fried chicken or whatever. At the sink portion. <coughs> and he's talking about them worse than you'd talk about Vince Russo. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it was it was terrible, and told the story that he, Carrie after after I left and they went broke again. Uh, Carrie drove out to the farm and sat on the tree and at his daddy's farm and blew his breath. Now that's that's wanting to hurt pretty bad. And so they had a dysfunctional family. To say the least. So uh, you got out of that, that, that deal. Uh, you, just, you just basically gave it back to them and, 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 and walked away from it and cut your losses there. Where did you go back to Memphis at that time and start focusing on, on, on the Memphis territory? Well, uh, I get time. I was back for a while. But that's back to the Vince senior story. He calls me. It ended up being about three days before he died. And he said, Junior is uh, planning on running against everybody. He wants to call. And he said, I don't know if he'll be or, or he'll be a fan. But he said, I know this. There'll come a time in his life, friend, and you've always there anything. If Vince reaches that point in his life and he needs, I hope I can count on you. I said sure. And you know, things happen in your life, and I had no idea. I hung up the phone that, and and told my wife. I said. Vince wants me to help his boy if he gets in trouble. I said, that ain't going to happen. First of all, he ain't going to call me of all people. And sure enough, when the steroid thing happened, Vince starts calling me every Sunday. And we have these two hour long conversations. My wife called it. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Vince Day. Huh. <laughs> huh. So, so anyway, you know that story. I went up then when I came back, huh. I completely burned. But let me, let me tell you. I, I, I just, I missed you up there because at, at the time you came up there and was working side by side with Vince, I was here still here in Florida. I was running spots. I was running their, their Southern territory for them. I was running Florida, Georgia, Alabama as a, as a local promoters. So by the time I got up, a vet was calling, calling, calling everybody. He's calling me too. And then, you know, come on, I want you to be a part of the team and all this stuff. And uh, I remember getting a phone call on uh, on the step of the courthouse. I'm getting ready to go in and get my verdict now. Are you on the team? I said, yes, sir. You know, so I, yeah. but I, by the time I got up there, by, by the time I made my decision to actually go up to, to the office and work in the office, you had, you had already done what well, vets in, 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 uh, yeah, going to prison, so he don't need me here anymore. So you'd already given your notice and 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 and, and headed back south. Yeah, when when Vince left the courthouse after being totally exonerated, he came to the office, and I told I hugged him because I was really emotional. You know, he could have easily gone to prison, and it would have right. been so unfair, so unjust. So I was you know, caught up in the emotion and, and I hugged him. And then the next day I told him, I said, Vince, everything's fine. I love you, but I'm going home. And I did because I had that a beautiful home in Hendersonville, middle of a hundred acres with my horses and my cows and 
and I'd really missed them. So, uh, and I want to, I want to say this, there's a whole lot out there about man, man, and a lot of it is so off course and so bad and so unjust. Vince has a heart of gold. Now, I don't know what your experience was, but let me tell you, when I came home, he kept sending me my check. And I would call and say, Vince, you need to straighten that accounting out. They keep sending me the checks. I've got three of them here. You want me to send them back? And he said, no, I want you to keep them. Then I get a call from Eric Bischoff. And Eric says, I'd like for you to come on my staff as a, I said, I'm not interested in Atlanta. He said, just talk to me on the telephone. You don't have to come down here ever. So I said, well, let me check with Vince McMahon and see what he says. He's still paying. So I called Vince and told him, he said, take the job, Jerry. I said, why? He said, they ain't going to listen to anything you've got to say. And the more money you can get out of them, the quicker Ted huh. Turner will go broke. <laughs> For a year. Gerald for a year, I'd go to the mailbox and have a WWE check and a WCW. <laughs> and, That's great. And I would call Vince and I'd say, Vince, I don't feel right. I'm taking a, your check and theirs. He said, we're breaking, we're breaking Ted Turner. Enjoy the money. <laughs> <laughs> That's an awesome bit. Why, why did why did the government go after Vince? I mean, it seems to it seems bogus to me because it'd be like going after Pete Rozelle of the NFL because guys in the NFL before say '87 were taking la, steroids. La, 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 or any of it. On all those guys, yeah. The it, just, it made no sense to me. The government's case made zero sense to me. No, it it, it was crazy, and the reason I think they went, of course, I'm, you know, I wasn't on the inside. But I think it's so political if a prosecutor were to knock off Vince McMahon in New York City, he'd have a political advantage to run for mayor or some other office. I think it was purely a political move because it had no foundation. I mean, here, WWE mail room, I'm sure they took in more mail than Walmart. And how is Vince going to check every package that comes in? And then he, what's he going to open them and see if there's steroids in them? That's what they were charging him with. Distribution of steroids. Crazy. Yeah, absolutely bogus because they didn't go after any other sport. They went after no other entertainment. They, they chose to go after events. It just seemed like you said a, either a personal vendetta or something political because the whole thing, but you almost ruined a guy's life. If it oh. hadn't been Vince McMahon, that ruins most people's lives if it wasn't, if it wasn't a Vince McMahon. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that uh, I've always uh, lo loved about, I saw your interview, I think you did with Conrad, you talked about Jimmy Cornette, that you, <laughs> that you said, you said, if anybody can annoy you that bad, he can annoy everybody. Jim yeah. Cornette's one of the greatest man. I love Jimmy Cornette. He's one of the greatest managers of all time. Smart guy can talk, but tell the story about how you got Jim Cornette into being a manager. All right. His mother and my mother were great friends. Both of them single parents. So Jimmy took pictures at the Louisville matches. That was his home, Louisville. So he wanted to come to Memphis, cause Memphis TV in particular, because that was kind of the mecca in, in our area. And so 
my mother intervened and please take please take him. So after two or three weeks, I said, all right, send him down. So when he got down there, I said, Jimmy, stay out of the way. Take the take your pictures, but stay out of the way. Yes, sir. So there's a coffee area, a lounge area at the TV station. So I'm at a round table over in the corner talking to probably Lawler and Dundee, you know, about TV and I'm gonna try to accomplish. And Jimmy Cornette is holding court across the coffee room. And he's talking loud and boisterous. You know how. Ben Cornette. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm sitting there. I said, my mother's going to be mad, but I can't put up with that son of a bitch. He's <laughs> driving me batty. <laughs> and, and so... Uh, Whoever was sitting there said, yeah, we need to put him out there. He can get a lot of heat with the fans and not turn on the light. So I got up and walked over to him and I said, do you want to be in the wrestling business? Yes, sir. I said, we'll show up next week. And he said, what do you want me to say? That I don't care. Just talk like you're right here. <laughs> so he did. And he well, you know, the rest is history. He became yeah. great managers of all time. I saw part of the, one of the clips of his, one of his first interviews with Lance Russell where he's talking about his mother and his mother's written him a check. And it was, it was one of the greatest interviews because it's just heat. It's just nothing but heat. You look at that interview and you, you hate that man. Yeah. Corny, Corny was so good from the start. Well, see, that's what he was telling him at that table about my mother i don't ever want for anything fellas she gives me a check whenever i need it and you know i'm thinking yeah slap that check upside your head <laughs> <laughs> what the one uh, michael hayes is a is good good friend of ours as he has a lot of people's uh when he first introduced music to it was that with you because after Michael and the Freebirds started introducing music or you started that era, all of a sudden everything starts having music. That's when he had rock and wrestling with Cindy Lauper up in uh, WWE in New York. But what was your thoughts when Michael first came to you about putting music to his entrance? Well, we had, we had, you're talking about the Freebird deal? Yes, sir. Right. Freebirds. Yeah. Um, we were doing the music videos and the reason that started, I would ask my, I would call my daughter when I was home to come to dinner table. I'll be right there, daddy. And right there, I'll be right there was two minutes past, five minutes past. So I'd get up and go to her room and she's sitting on the floor with the legs and arms crossed glued to the tv and it's mtv and so i'm standing there watching it and you know blip blip fast boom boom cuts they would do 20 cuts in a 30 second video and i said uh well that's what the kids are liking wonder if i could do that with wrestling so we did and it really got a big hit now, the original Freebird video, uh, Fritz called me, bought me a plane ticket, and asked if I'd come out. And I flew out and showed him how to do the quick edits and put it to music with the wrestling video. And uh, whoever did it for him did a heck of a job because it turned out to be a great video. But um, that's kind of the genesis of it. And before that, though, the wrestlers didn't really have ring entrance music. It, it, oh. kind, of, it kind of developed during that time. Yeah. Uh, you know, I can be disputed, but it seems like Lawler came to me one 
uh, music first. Yeah. And of course, Michael, uh, you know, he was big on interests and he was kind of the leader of the team. And so, uh, so we started letting everybody, all the main events. Yeah, it just now, now when you see wrestling, it just, if you had it, if you didn't have it, it would seem strange. Oh, yeah, yeah. Huh. Well, you know, that uh, Vince, uh, Vince's son, Shane, went to a rock concert and came back in. And he's the one that talked Vince into putting on a spectacular show at the matches. The lights, the lasers, and uh, yeah, now it has to be a big production. An MTV video nowadays, man. They 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 invest they invest in a talent and invest in that, that music and uh, those entrances. You know, one thing that's really fascinating, uh, Memphis has always been an uh, innovative place there. How were you involved in the Andy Kaufman uh, set up, and what did you think of the Andy Kaufman, the whole whole deal that they, they that King Jerry Lawler and, and Andy Kaufman did? Well, one I know I know you made a fortune off of it. But. Yeah, one day I got a phone call, and the guy said, "This is Andy Kaufman." I said, "Yeah," and I'm Martin Luther King. <laughs> I said, no, I really am. And uh, he said, I have tried to get in New York and, and uh, for Vern God, I've tried a bunch of places and I'm told that you give people a chance. And I said, are you the Andy Kaufman? Yeah. He said, here's my stick. I do a wrestling deal in my stand up comedy routine, but he said, I ha I'm a pretty good wrestler. As a matter of fact, I'll put up $5,000 that I can beat any woman anywhere. And I said, uh, well, that's interesting. I said, there are some women in Memphis that will clean your <laughs> He said, well, you, will you give me a chance? I said, yeah. So he came to Memphis and... Uh, that's the way it started. He, he put up his own money. One night, this big, strong black girl was about to beat him and won $5,000. Lola ran to the ring and interfered, <laughs> saved Andy's money. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what a sweet guy. You know, he never cashed a single check. Really? really? Never. Just did it because he loved it. Did it because he loved it. He said, wrestling is the only real theater left. And he said, I just loved it. Where did he get the women to wrestle? Were they women wrestlers? Where, where, the, the women that he oh, came in? Oh, our announcer would say, Andy Kaufman's here, and he says he can beat any woman here in a wrestling match. Now there's no fist thrown. It's got to, you'll be automatically disqualified. If he throws a fist, you win the five thousand dollars because he'll be disqualified. Do we have any volunteers? And every night, four or five big women would come up. <laughs> what? And he would point to one of them. Usually, he'd pick out the biggest, strongest one. And he, he was a decent wrestler. He could hook them and pin them. That seems like a, that seems like a strange fetish that he yeah. had more than, more, than, more than wrestling. Yeah. The, why didn't he work it? I mean, why, why didn't he do the same thing? I mean, he's, he's getting heat. Why wouldn't he work it instead of having a shoot volunteer? Well, that was just his gimmick. He know, I mean, he wasn't a wrestler, you know, who's going to book him? I had the reputation of booking anything that had a warm body and I <laughs> <laughs> knew wouldn't book him. <laughs> no. But uh, 
you know, it, it worked. And then uh, him and Lola, that was magic. Oh, I've got a funny story about Bill Watts again. Bill called me after that thing aired on TV and said, man, I've just got to hand it to y'all. Take that damn comedian, that Hollywood jerk, and put him in the hospital. That's the way we need to protect the business. And Watts was enjoying it so much, I didn't have the nerve to tell him, Bill, it's work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. When you, can work, when you can work the guys, you know you're a good worker. <laughs> yeah. Well, Kaufman stayed in the hospital for either two or three days working, yes. working the doctors, right? Yeah, he was supposed to go for one one night and check and turn him loose. And, and he went and the doctors took x-rays and all and put him in traction. And <laughs> it, instead of him saying, no, I'm all right, he goes along with it and tells them, I, I can't move my left arm. And, and you know, it took him two or three days to get to where, Doc, I feel a lot better. I believe I can go to rehab now. And he told him <laughs> going to rehab in New York or California. <laughs> what, was, what was his plan with, with the women? I mean, did he, did he have like an end game for this? Or was it just, I'm going to come down and wrestle some women? Like, like he went on the comedy club circuit. He was doing appearances in wrestling. You know, he went on national TV and carried the work on with Lawler. Lawler slapped him, and you know, it was it was crazy. He he wanted it to go on and on and on forever. I, I, I bet the local press down there in Memphis and Nashville was eating you guys alive, you know, wanting information and everything. It had to be so much positive publicity, you know, that, that you, grant, uh, you gained from that. Well, it was more national publicity than it was local. Local, wow. The, the soap commercial he did and the stuff he did about hygiene, those were some of the greatest videos I've ever seen. He and was such a good heel. And he wrote it all himself. Wow. He's, he was just a genius, a common, comedian genius. Did the guys get along with Andy backstage? Was he, did he, was he active with oh. the talent? Or, or how, how was he accepted by the talent backstage? Such a sweet guy and so humble and so appreciative. And, and he'd tell everybody, I admire what y'all do so much. He said, I stand back here and it looks so real. So, you know, everybody loved him. Did it ever occur to you to like give it, get somebody like Ronda Rousey out there and just split the money with her? <laughs> no. Because uh, <laughs> it just. It just is made for a double cross to get some. And JBL, I'm sure you've wrestled Memphis and looked in that audience. I mean, there's some girls out there in that audience. I don't think Ronald Rousey could be. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'd do it, Jerry, but I'd make it a work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you also had, I got to ask you because I love, uh, I love honky talk, the Wayne Ferris. But you had him down there, the concession stand brawl. I mean, you, you had some stuff with, with Wayne. I always call him honky tonk. It's unusual for me to call him Wayne. Uh, that was He was a really good worker and was doing some great things for you down there in uh, Tennessee, especially that concession stand brawl, right? Way before he became the longest reigning intercontinental champion of all time. Yeah. Yeah. It, he was uh, – he and Lawler were first cousins. And uh, – there was always a little bit of heat between Wayne thought that Jerry got the inside track on stardom, <laughs> <laughs> but that, uh, that brawl in Tupelo, uh, I, I got a crazy idea off of a newscast. Some guy went into a bar and they had a free for all and they, showed about 30 seconds of it. I don't know how the security camera in the bar. 
yeah, that's the way they showed it. And you know, you could you couldn't see it all, but I said, boy, that's exciting. So I just my contribution was I said, why don't y'all let the fight spill out into the concession stand? And they they carried it from there. <laughs> <laughs> Were, were you part of the conversation? We had uh, Jerry Lawler on a couple weeks ago, and uh, I worked with King for years and years. When he was uh, in negotiations to wrestle Elvis uh, at one point, were you were you any part of that? No, I, I'm, I don't know anything about it. Apparently, Vernon Presley, they talk, talks about doing some type of, you know, they'd already done the uh, Anoki uh, and Ali match, and Jerry had some talks with, Vernon Presley about doing something with Elvis, but it never came to fruition because Elvis, you know, passed away unexpectedly. I, yeah. didn't, I didn't know if you had anything, uh, any, no. any part of those talks. Elvis came to the matches when we ran at Hook Conventions, and that was before Lawless. Yeah. That's, and, that's the only thing I know about Elvis and wrestling. The one other thing uh, I wanted to ask you was uh, Ricky and Robert, you know, the fabulous ones, Steve Kern. I mean, those guys were, those guys were awesome. People don't realize how over they were, but you created uh, Ricky and Robert basically to counter the fabulous ones, right? Yeah. That, that's a cute story. We were booking two towns a night and Lawler would headline one and, uh, the Fabs would headline the other two. And then I'd have a single match of Dundee or, or Dutch Mantel or somebody be the top two matches with the fabulous ones. And then Lawler would be on top and the Midnight Express or somebody would be underneath. Well, fabulous ones are red hot. And uh, Lawler came to me and he said, this is not fair because I would rib him. I'd say, boy, the fabulous, <laughs> they drew $12,000 in <laughs> town that's population 500. You were over here in Jackson, Tennessee, and, and you didn't draw that much. So he said, that's what it is. I need... Uh, I need a hot tag team that the young girls like. So we were TV one morning and he, he comes in Walmart with a, a sack full, a grocery sack full of bandanas. And he just ties them all over Ricky and Robert and says, y'all are the rock and roll express and you're going to be with me and all my bands. <laughs> <laughs> That's how back. And it just happened to be the right guys. I mean, those guys were over. So, so I mean, they, they helped pop the Bill Watts territory when you loaned them out, right? I mean, those guys yeah. were really drawing houses all over the all over the country. Yeah, Watts came up to me and said, "I'm I'm going broke. Will you come down and see what the situation is?" So I went down. Had a bunch of big guys and not a lot of action, and so. I, I sent him Cornette and the Midnight Express and the Rock and Roll Express. And I knew he didn't know how to book little guys. So I sent Dundee, Bill Dundee as the booker and uh, turned his territory around. Um, Terry Taylor was his single. Anyway, I sent him a whole crew. And doggone it, if, when he and Crockett decided to go against Vince, he comes in and runs against me in Memphis. <laughs> With your talent? Huh? With your talent? Did they bring your talent in or were they exclusive yeah. to you? Wow. Yeah, I, I rented the ballpark in front of the Mid-South Coliseum and had a, a free ball game. And huh. so he, he lost his butt. <laughs> Didn't come back. Well, at the free ball game, you also had all of your talent playing in the game, right? 
Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the heels against the baby faces. So you booked a, a free ball game with the heels versus baby faces right across the, from the Coliseum. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> tremendous. <laughs> Yeah. Jerry, Jerry, when, when WCW was going broke that last time and they, they were up for sale, were there any uh, any thoughts from you of, of, of buying that before Vent bought it, or did was you you didn't have any desire? You mentioned earlier that, that you didn't like Atlanta. Or, that, or was there any thoughts about you taking that that spot? Uh, yeah, I tried to buy it. You heard that story, haven't you? No, I haven't. You tell it to us. John Corcoran is a guy in uh, Boston, and uh, he's uh, got a lot of money and he has a lot of friends. There, but they sent uh, John called and said, "I'm a candidate." And they sent books, and John sent me just a recap of the last five years and look at it and I said uh, he said Can you turn this around and I said sure and he said how many points of it do you want to get involved I said I want 35% so he said all right I'm going to make a play for it and he, he made, gave a 70 million dollar offer and they never responded But for the history buffs, the guy that orchestrated the sale to WWE went to work at WWE shortly after the sale. So what did they tell you about the $70 million offer? Did they just turn it down? Did they? They didn't respond. See, they, that, isn't as wild as it sounds. They took in, they had a cash flow of 125 million a year. So all you had, to, they had people on the payroll. Uh, and I hope it's not true, but I heard that uh, the Fox, uh, well, not Fox, uh, Tony Collins, that. I heard they're doing the same thing. Have this enormous payroll of people that aren't wrestling. And WCW, they had 16 pieces of talent that were under contract for in excess of a million dollars. So their payroll for the top 16 talents was 16 million. It was about 18. Some of them were a little over. You know, like Hogan, I think his was four. The Crazy. only thing that the only thing that makes me really mad is that I wasn't one of those sixteen. Me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so the expense was kind of what kept kept you away from it. No, those were basically art clad, but they, weren't they uh, the big ones? Uh, contracted not to WCW, but to Turner Broadcasting. So. Yeah, I I mean the. They just spent money foolishly. And uh, all they had to do was run it like you do a business. You know, if I pay you a dollar, you better make me a dollar and a quarter, or I'm going to quit paying you your dollar. You know, some people have to go to Stanford Business School to learn that. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. I. I was able to learn it in West High School. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever miss now the business? I mean, you were in it, you've been in it your entire life. And I understand that's what you do in retirement. You get to enjoy the grandkids and your ranch. You got a beautiful place there. Do you ever miss uh, being around the business, the, the creative part of it, the business part of the whole thing? No, it's kind of like the business that I was around is no more. And so the business that I see on television and uh, isn't really something that I can identify with. You know, we were, you know, we were into storylines and 
and drama and emotion and uh, I don't see that anymore. It's more, uh, you know, five star matches and triple somersault off the top rope, throw somebody out and three guys catch him. They don't allow the fans to suspend this belief. Now, everybody's making a lot of money and they're doing good. So it won't be me to knock it, but it's just not. The business that I love and knew doesn't seem to be. Yeah. It's interesting. Well, Mr. Jared, uh, uh, there's so many things that I want to ask you, but I, I want to thank you for coming on the yeah. show. It's, it's been, it, it, when Jerry told me we had, we had you on the show, I was so excited because you've done so much. I've heard so much about you. I got to ride with uh, Dutch Mantel for uh, about a year in WWE and, and Dutch is such a good friend. He's one of the best storytellers I've ever been around. But he always told great stories about you. So it's been a true honor to, to be able to meet you and have you on the show and talk about so many great parts of, of our business that uh, has been so fantastic to all of us. Well, I wish we could have worked together, but I've been an admirer of yours from afar for a long time, ever since your shoot match. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. And you shook with him, but I, I, I deserted him. But Jerry, before you leave, you know, holiday season is coming up, Thanksgiving's coming up, and you have the reputation of being a great, great chef. I want to know what is your recipe for chicken salad? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I am thinking seriously about, I'd have to kid you, Gerald, if I told you. My recipe. It's kind of like Coca Cola. But a cigarette. Bruce Pritchard has already given. He's made a living. He's made a fortune. Eh? He should give you a commission off that, Jerry. Yeah, well, but he's made chicken salad worldwide famous. <laughs> so when's the recipe coming out? <laughs> I want to know. How, I want to know how to make it for Thanksgiving, brother. <laughs> Those fellas in Tampa asked me if I would come next year and put on a cooking seminar and make salad there. I mean, my chicken salad. Wow. Well, I'd buy one. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. <laughs> Well, Jerry, I like job, man. I sure appreciate it. You know, I know it's running into you. I saw I'm sitting there thinking I've seen that line across here. I said, man, that guy's got more story than than anybody. You know, he he'd been around, and you you came over to my table, and we we kind of talked a little bit. Then before it was over, with, I had to chase you down the hall to get you. I think we went to the men's room, and made our deal where most wrestling deals are made, and I asked you if you'd come on our show. He said, I'd be glad to. That was a thrill. And I immediately called John and said, we got it. <laughs> and he was thrilled to death. So thank you so much for your time and, and your story and all you've done for this wrestling business. It's a great business, even though it's far from what you and I first come into, man, it's still the wrestling business. And, uh, and uh, you still got to respect all the talent, no matter what they do. And, and you do, and I do. And, and man, it, it's been a pleasure having having you on today. Thank you. Absolutely. And Gerald, I, you know that I, the respect I have for you and Jack, and the contributions that y'all have given to this great business of ours. And uh, I'll always love you. Thank you, bro. Same here. <laughs>